Well, hello again and welcome to this third lecture in the series for Region College Vancouver on Christian apologetics. And it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you again, if you're only in this rather remote and virtual way. Now, in the previous lecture, I explored how Christianity helps us to make sense of things. And this, I think, naturally leads us into thinking about whether we can prove our core beliefs. And in fact, how this feeds into our wider discussion of the relationship of faith and doubt. And I think these are really quite important apologetic questions. When I myself was a teenage atheist back in the 1960s, I was convinced that religious people had a really big problem. It was self-evident truth to me at any rate, that atheism was right. But you see, my Christian friends couldn't prove that their belief in God was right. But then you see, gradually I realized that I had a problem I believed that there was no God as an atheist, but I couldn't prove that there was no God. And to my intense discomfort, I have to say, I began to realize actually atheism was a faith, a, a belief that there was no God, which I could not actually prove was right. Now, obviously, I consoled myself with all kinds of arguments, uh, like the very spurious argument that belief in God is very, very improbable or that it's impossible to prove a negative. But I think deep down, I knew I had a problem. So let me tell you the way I see things now. And it's this, basically. Look, you can prove things like two and two make four, and that's absolutely certain. But you see, the problem is you cannot prove things that really matter, like what is the meaning of life or whether or not there's a God. If I can put it like this, you can only prove shallow truths. The ones that really matter lie beyond proof. Now, I'm going to come back to that point later in this lecture. But let's turn to the very first major theme I want to explore with you today, and that is the idea of faith itself. So how do we explain faith to a sceptical culture? Well, I think one answer, which actually is a very good starting point for discussion, is to point out that we all believe and trust in certain things that we cannot prove to be true. I remember a sceptical friend once saying to me, you can't be sure about anything. So I came back at him with a question. Are you sure about that? Now, he didn't like that very much, but I have to say it does raise a really important question. Because the Harvard psychologist William James points out that we all face situations where the evidence simply is not compelling. So if we cannot reach a decision that we are absolutely sure is right. And yet a decision has to be made. We have to choose what we think is right. Now, I'm going to talk more about William James later in this lecture because I think you'll find him really interesting. But let's move on and think about this idea of faith in more detail. And I think the key point to make here is that Christianity holds that there is a door that's hidden in the scheme of things that leads us into another world, a new way of understanding, a new way of living, and a new way of hoping. And this, of course, is faith. Now, faith, I'm going to stress, is a complex idea. Faith goes far beyond simply asserting or holding that certain things are true. And faith really is a relational idea. It points to the capacity of God to captivate our imaginations, to excite us, to transform us and to accompany us on the journey of life. And here's a point which I think really is very important from the point of view of apologetics. Faith goes beyond what can be demonstrated by logic and yet is nevertheless capable of rational motivation and foundation. So the point I'm making here is that faith is to be seen as a form of motivated or warranted belief. So in plain English, faith is not a blind leap into the dark. If you like, it's a, a joyful discovery of a bigger picture of things of which we are part. Now, one of the most familiar ways of envisaging God's presence in life is set out in Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 speaks of God as being our shepherd, who's always with us, if you like, a gracious and consoling presence on the journey of life, even as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So the Christian faith talks to us about God as our companion and our healer, one who makes sense of the puzzles and enigmas of life. 
And the world may seem to be enveloped in shadow, difficult to make sense of, but God is our light who illuminates our paths as we travel. So let's think about two very simple words with which the Christian creeds begin. I believe. What do Christians mean when they speak those words? Well, what they are talking about is having discovered, if you like, a place of refuge, a way of seeing the world that makes sense and a firm place on which they may stand. And so the first declaration of the creeds, I believe, is thus not so much an item of belief, but an assertion of the need for faith in the first place if we're going to lead a meaningful life. And for the Christian, faith is both trusting that there is a big picture of life and a decision and a commitment to step into this way of seeing ourselves and our world and to live it out. So if you like, faith enfolds a way of understanding our world, but also a commitment on our part to live and think on its basis as we find ourselves transformed in and through our faith. But here's a point that I think is really important. It's not just Christians who believe. And the key point here is that any political or moral or religious or actually anti-religious worldview demands faith in that its core beliefs cannot be demonstrated to be true. That's why I think the Greek philosopher Xenophanes is so interesting because he argued that life involves, I quote, a woven web of guesses. And his point is that to hold to any belief or moral value is to judge that these are true and trustworthy while at the same time knowing they can't be proved. Now, I mentioned earlier in this lecture my sense of dismay when I realized that my youthful atheism, which I had fondly believed was self-evidently true, was actually a judgment, an interpretation of the world rather than an evidentially compelling factual statement about it. You see, when I was an atheist, I believed that there was no God and I lived out my life on the basis of that belief. And yet, of course, I came to realize I could not prove my own core beliefs, namely that there is no God. Uh, well, I expected religious believers to often be compelling proof of their beliefs. I can now see there are no knockdown arguments that compel us either to believe in God or to believe there is no God. And if a decision has to be made, it takes the form of a judgment about what is the most trustworthy belief. Now, do you see the point I'm making? Everyone, even the atheist, has a creed that begins, whether implicitly or explicitly, with the words, I believe. Christians simply make their faith open, transparent, where others prefer to conceal or downplay it. Now, some might respond to what I've just said by saying, well, look, you know, you've, you've actually made every belief legitimate because you can prove lots of things. Well, no, no. Faith is about motivated judgment, and that means there have to be good reasons for coming to such a conclusion, even though this conclusion itself cannot be demonstrably proved. So no one is saying you believe anything you like. You need to have reasons for believing what you do. But the point is that not even the natural sciences can deliver secure answers to the deepest questions that we would ask about the meaning of life or value or purpose. And science has to make judgments about which is the best theoretical representation of some aspect of our world. Now, those judgments are clearly rationally motivated. They're clearly granted in the evidence, but they remain provisional reasonable beliefs and they're not proven facts. Now, this doesn't reduce us to despair. Of course it doesn't. It simply highlights the importance of faith in making judgments that cannot be proved to be true, yet rightly command our intellectual loyalty as being trustworthy. And my point is that no human worldview, whether religious, political or atheist, can prove its core beliefs and we have to live, learn to live with them with a degree of uncertainty. Now, many Christians feel a bit embarrassed when they're asked to prove their beliefs. Very often, I think, we feel vulnerable when confronted with someone like the new atheist polemicist Christopher Hitchens, who seemed so 
absolutely confident about his own atheism. But listen very carefully, please, because Hitchens rhetorical aggressiveness simply masks a deep and an important truth. He couldn't prove his atheism was right and he knew it. The rhetorical bluster was simply there to conceal this awkward truth. I mean, Hitchens and I may have believed in quite different views of the world, but we have one very important thing in common, and that is that we both take our positions as a matter of faith. Neither of us could prove that we were right. I was just being honest about this. Now, that's a very important point, and you need to use that point apologetically. And let me take that point further. Um, some of you may have read some works by the atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell. Now, I like Russell. He showed a refreshing honesty about the intellectual predicament of atheism. Russell was actually an epistemological agnostic. He knew it was impossible to prove the truth of either atheism or Christianity. And for Russell, um, philosophy teaches us, and I quote him, how to live without certainty and yet without being paralyzed by hesitation. And for Russell, you simply couldn't settle a God question by reason or by science. And he made the point that any position you took on this matter was ultimately a matter of faith. But I've just said that Russell was an atheist philosopher, and here's the point I want you to note. Russell saw his decision to live as an atheist, as a contestable lifestyle choice. And he was absolutely clear there were other defensible choices that were possible. He knew he couldn't prove this belief to be right, but he proposed to live out his life as if it were true. In other words, it was a pragmatic judgment, a matter of choice, a matter of preference, and in the end, of course, a matter of faith. Now, suppose you were asked to explain to someone what Christian faith is all about. I, I wonder what you would say. Well, here's what I think I would say now. I think I would say that my faith is about having found something and someone who I can trust, who makes sense of my world and my life, and gives me the basis for living meaningfully in this world. And so for me, the opening words of the creed, I believe, are actually as much an invitation to trust God as they are an affirmation of the trustworthiness of belief in God. Now, I'm sure you can do better than this, but this might help you work out what you would say. Now, here's a point that might be interesting and helpful. The Apostles' Creed opens with the Latin word, credo, again, credo, which is almost always translated as I believe. And that's understandable, but I need to say to you that the proper meaning of credo at a time when the creeds were written was to trust, to confide in a person or thing, to have confidence in, or to trust. Do you see the point I'm making? We tend to think of faith as a kind of theoretical judgment, but the creeds see it as a personal commitment. It's an invitation to share the faith of Abraham, who trusted God's promises and set out into the unknown. Think, for example, of Genesis 12, 1 to 4. And all those, of course, who came after him, who trusted in the same joy-giving, life-changing God. Now, let me make it clear, yes, Christianity is about certain ideas which we believe, but actually more fundamentally, it's about a God whom we discover to be trustworthy and who we invite to become the foundation and the lodestar of our lives. So faith is about acknowledging and trusting a God who journeys with us even when we pass through dark times and dark places. And so I suppose you could say this, and you may find this point quite helpful in your conversations with other people. Faith is actually relational, not just cognitive. See the point? It's about trusting someone who illuminates the landscape of life so that we can find our way back home. But faith is also about 
making sense of things. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I moved from atheism to Christianity when I was a science student at Oxford University back in the 1970s. And I, I stopped being an atheist back then, partly because of my growing realization of the intellectual overambition of the form of atheism I'd embraced as a teenager, but also because I began to realize that Christianity offered me a way of making sense of the world I observed around me and experienced within me. So that's a really important point and I want to move on and talk a bit about this whole theme of the ability of faith to make sense of our world, sense of our lives. In other words, we're going to talk about the rationality of faith. Now, it's important for us to know and to be able to show that Christianity makes sense. And I think the rationality of the Christian faith can be demonstrated in two different, although I think clearly complementary ways. First of all, by showing that there is a good argumentative or evidential base for the core beliefs of Christianity. And that a kind of approach might include developing arguments for the existence of God or historical arguments for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the key point here is you're making a case for the reliability, the trustworthiness of the fundamental elements of the Christian faith. But there's a second way in which we can do this, and that's by showing that if the Christian faith is true, then it makes more sense of reality than its alternatives. In other words, it fits in with our observations and experience more plausibly than its alternatives. And those of you who are scientists will realize there's a clear analogy here with the testing of scientific theories. We usually test theories by their ability to accommodate or to explain observations. But this demonstration of the reasonableness of Christianity really does matter. And you may know the very famous comments of Austin Farrer, who was a close friend of C.S. Lewis, who commented on why Lewis was so successful an apologist. And he said, it's all because he was able to offer, and I quote, a positive exhibition of the force of Christian ideas morally, imaginatively, and rationally. And Farrow was making the point that Lewis's approach to apologetics showed how Christianity made sense of the deepest intuitions of our mind, our heart, and our imagination. Now, Farrow really thought it was important to bring out the rationality of faith. And he, he made the point, which I think is actually quite a good point, that it's difficult to defend the Christian faith publicly if people think it's basically irrational. And Lewis's great achievement, according to Austin Farrow, was to demonstrate the reasonableness of faith in a way that made it easier for people to accept it in our culture. So listen to what Farrow says about Lewis and see what you think. Here's what he says. Though argument does not create conviction, the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. Now, I think those are really quite helpful comments. Uh, so let's just be clear about one thing. To demonstrate the rationality of the Christian faith does not mean proving every article of faith is right. It rather means basically being able to show that there are good reasons for thinking that they are trustworthy and reliable. And one way in which you could do this is by showing how the Christian faith makes sense of what we observe and experience. And let me encourage you to talk to your friends about what is about your faith that helps you to make sense of what you experience or what you see in the world around you. And if you like, the Christian faith can be compared to a lens that brings things into focus or, or a light which allows us to see further and more clearly than we could manage on our own. Now, I mentioned that I used to be a scientist when I was a student, and one of the writers I really enjoyed reading back then was the philosopher and scientist Michael Polanyi. 
And you probably know that Polanyi was a Hungarian chemist who later went on to explore the philosophical implications and consequences of the scientific method. And he rather neatly summarized the dynamics of the scientific endeavor like this. Listen to this. The pursuit of discovery is guided by sensing the presence of a hidden reality towards which our clues are pointing. Now, isn't that a nice quote? Science for Polanyi can be thought of as a quest for this hidden reality towards which our clues are pointing. And you know, that, that word clue, I think, is really very significant. You know, it's all about observing certain things, but then having to figure out what they mean. And as we saw in the previous lecture, C.S. Lewis famously described things such as the human sense of right and wrong as, I quote, clues to the meaning of the universe. Now, clues are not hard proofs. They are soft pointers and they build up to point in a definite direction. The accumulation of clues often has an intellectual intensity that transcends the power of some things that people call proofs. Now, I'm going to say something about the Enlightenment demand for certainty at this point. Uh, this idea is so typical of this bygone age of reason, which held that you could prove anything and everything that mattered. So let me talk to you more about this now and why it's so important. Now, Western culture continues to be shaped by the ideas of the 18th century enlightenment, especially this demand to prove what you believe. Now, to its critics, and I have to say, actually, there are rather a lot of these, uh, the Enlightenment treated every area of human knowledge as if it were geometry or logic. And these are disciplines in which you can prove things. But logic and geometry are both closed systems. What I mean by that is they don't interact with the real world. So you can't extrapolate from these to every area of life, like the natural sciences or politics or ethics, or of course, religious belief. And the key issue in real life is not being able to prove what you believe, but about offering good reasons for your belief. It's about justification rather than proof, to use the jargon. But there's another point I want to make here. One of the reasons for rejecting the Enlightenment's hopelessly optimistic view of knowledge is that it actually can imprison us within a rigid and dogmatic worldview which limits reality to that which we can prove rationally. Things like two and two make four. And as the great Oxford philosopher and intellectual historian Isaiah Berlin pointed out, the, the dominant mood in Western culture from the late 19th century onwards has been, and I quote, the rejection of reason and order as being prison houses of the spirit. And his point is simple. To limit yourself to what reason and science can prove is merely to skim the surface of reality and to fail to discover the hidden depths that lie beneath. So I want to do a little experiment, which you might find fun. I want you to imagine you limit yourself only to beliefs that you can prove. You can prove two and two make four. Now, what else could you prove is true? Actually, when you think about this, you'll realize it's a very, very small world. You can't prove anything about ethical values or the meaning of life. And yet we need these if we're going to live meaningfully. So let's listen to John Polkinghorn, a quantum theorist who became a theologian on this point. And for Polkinghorn, science aims to find the best explanation in the knowledge that often cannot be proved. And also, of course, that what one generation considers to be right might actually be discarded by another as simply yesterday's ideas. Listen to what Polkinghorn has to say. No form of truth, human truth-seeking inquiry can attain absolute certainty about its conclusions. The realistic aspiration is that of attaining the best explanation of complex phenomena, a goal to be achieved by searching for an understanding that's sufficiently comprehensive and well-motivated as to afford the basis for rational commitment. Neither science nor religion can entertain the hope of establishing logically coercive proof of the kind that only a fool could deny. That's actually a very 
important point. And you may find that quote from Porky Horn quite helpful, actually. Uh, it's very good to drop that into a talk you're giving. And the key point here is that for Polkinghorne, both science and Christian belief are committed to finding the best evidence-based explanation of what we actually observe and encounter in the world. That's very important. And for the Christian, apologetics is partly about affirming the conceptual resonance between the Christian theoretical framework and the deeper structures of the world, as these are discovered by the natural sciences. Now, I'm Irish, as you probably know, so let me mention an Irish writer who I think might help us as we think about this whole question of faith and certainty. And this is John Banville, who won the Booker Prize in 2005 for his novel The Sea. And Banville often engages critically with the hopes of the age of reason to find absolute certainty of meaning and truth in the natural sciences. And Banville points out how scientists like Copernicus or Kepler or Newton tried to discern the hidden order of our universe and to live in accordance with it. And yet, as Banville points out, their quest for certainty actually proved elusive. Here's what he says, and this is, again, is a very interesting point. I quote, I saw a certain kind of pathetic beauty in the obsessive search for a way to be in the world, in the existentialist search for something that would be authentic. And gradually, of course, the, the power of that vision faded. I was forced to deal with the fragility and the provisionality of human knowledge. It was a great idea, but it didn't work. You couldn't prove it was right. And Banville really points out how there was a degree of overinvestment in the sciences, which ended up not being able to deliver what people thought they would. And so Banville describes how Western culture experienced a sort of unsettling transition from a kind of Cartesian certainty, we can prove everything we believe, to a Wittgensteinian despair. We, we can't do this. And I think that's a really important point because Bandel's making the point that gradually people began to realize that the irreducible complexity of the world was such that it just could not be expressed in the clear, uncertain ways that the Enlightenment expected. And so in some of his novels, Banville chron chronicles the slow and the irreversible transition in the West from rational certainty to existential despair, if you like, from the certainties of modernism to the diversity of beliefs of postmodernism. And Bandle makes a very important point, and I want you to listen to this very carefully. His point is that what one generation took to be rational certainties were found by a later generation simply to be cultural constructions. And interesting, you, you find this kind of way of thinking living on in the rather curious cultural backwater of the new atheism. And we're going to look at that in the 14th lecture. I think you'll find that really quite interesting. Uh, so that's new atheism, but everyone else is trying to figure out how to cope with the predicament in which we find ourselves, in which not even the natural sciences can deliver secure answers to the deepest questions we rightly ask about our meaning, our value and purpose. But here's the point to emphasize. This does not reduce us to despair. It simply highlights the importance of faith in making judgments that cannot be proved to be true, but yet rightly command our intellectual loyalty as being trustworthy. Now for both Dorothy L. Sayers and C.S. Lewis, Christianity offered a rational view of reality it invites us to see ourselves and our strange world as they really are, not in terms that we've invented. And for Dorothy L. Sayers, interestingly, Christianity was a discovery of a, a big picture, the way things actually are, not veiled by the ambitions of our creative imagination. But here's a point. If there is indeed such a big picture, we seem unable to grasp it in full by ourselves. If you like, we need help if we are to see things properly. And that, of course, is a classic theme of Christian theology. And the notion of divine revelation is about the disclosure of a view of reality which we did not invent 
and which tantalizingly lies beyond the capacity of human reason to fully grasp. And Revelation, you know, is not about the violation of human reason, but rather about the demonstration of its limits. If you like, Revelation is about the illumination of the landscape of our world so that we can see things more clearly and grasp something of what lies beyond the scope of our vision, if only in part. As the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 13, we see through a glass darkly, securing at best a partial glimpse, a darkened glimpse, of what we know to be a grander landscape. Now here's the point you need to emphasise. Religious faith is not a rebellion against reason, rather it's a revolt against the imprisonment of humanity within the cold and limiting walls of the kind that rationalist dogmatism has given us from the time of the Enlightenment. And sure, human logic may be rationally good, but it's also existentially deficient. You know, the really important things in life are just not things we can prove by logic. We need more than that. And some of those who boast of being free thinkers are really just uh, those who've been imprisoned by a now defunct 18th century rationalism, who fail to kind of face up to the radical changes in our understanding of rationality that have happened in the last generation. That, I have to say, is something that Richard Dawkins has yet to discover. So let me explain what I mean by that. Now, for the writers of the New Atheism, religious belief is simply irrational. Its core beliefs cannot be proved scientifically. And there's a very important point here. What I think is really interesting is that the new atheism applies criteria of rationality to religion that fails to apply to itself. It thus violates what most philosophers consider to be a core epistemic virtue. In other words, treating others intellectually as you would wish them to treat you. And writers like Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens judge others by standards that they refuse to acknowledge as normative in assessing their own beliefs. Now, I want you to note that point and make use of it. And Dawkins actually had to concede this point in a very interesting you know, Oxford University debate with Rowan Williams in 2012, uh, when he realised he couldn't verify his own atheism on either scientific or rational grounds, and therefore was an epistemological agnostic. That's a really interesting point. Now, I mentioned in an earlier lecture the Harvard psychologist William James, and William James argued that human beings all need what he calls working hypotheses to make sense of our experience of the world. And these working hypotheses often lie beyond total proof, yet they are accepted and acted upon because they are found to offer reliable and satisfying standpoints from which to engage the real world. And for James, uh, faith is a very important part of everyday human life. And James defined faith like this. Faith means belief in something concerning which doubt is still theoretically possible. Uh, or in another place, faith is a working hypothesis. We hold that certain things are true and rely upon them, but we realise that we can't prove them to tr be true as if they were a kind of proposition from Euclid's geometry. So I want to set James in context. I think that really helps us understand why what he is saying is so important. James's ideas were shaped during a period in the 19th century in which scholars speak of the eclipse of certainty. Again, the eclipse of certainty. And it was a time when the Enlightenment idea that we could sort out all of life's big questions decisively and with certainty through reason proved to be a delusion. And James offered a pragmatic approach to these questions because everyone realised the Enlightenment had failed to deliver. 
And the point here is that William James affirms the possibility of believing in a theory or way of making sense of things or a working hypothesis which is not finally confirmed and may not ultimately be capable of final confirmation, but, listen to this, but which is found to be reliable. Now that's a very important point. You may be able to prove it, but it turns out to be reliable and trustworthy. And I think the point that James is really getting at here that is that there are some really profoundly important realities in human existence, but these lie beyond the scope of proof. And for James, our most important beliefs are the ones that simply cannot be proven. That's true of Dawkins as well. He cannot prove his atheism. His core belief is there is no God, but that's a belief, not a proven fact. Let me make clear that it's a bit unfair of me to single out Dawkins for specific criticism here because other new atheist writers are equally prone to overstatement at this point. Very often they, they present their atheism as if it was self-evidently true. So it doesn't need to be proved. Only sort of other people need to prove their beliefs, not the new atheism. They are kind of exempt from the demand for rational justification. Christopher Hitchens, for example, boldly and completely inaccurately declares that new atheists like himself do not hold any beliefs in that they only accept what can be proved to be right. To quote him, our belief is not a belief. Well, no, that's simply wrong. Hitchens' anti-theism actually rests on a set of assumed moral values, such as religion is evil or God is not good, which he cannot demonstrate by rational argument. Hitchens appears merely to assume that his moral values will be shared by his readers, who are unlikely to ask awkward questions about their origins or their foundations or, of course, their reliability. So he lives by faith, though he pretends not to. So we've talked quite a bit about faith. I think it'd be really interesting now to start talking about doubt. So let's begin to think about doubt. Now here's an important apologetic question. How are we to deal with doubt? I think the simple answer is by setting it in context and realising that even atheists have good reason to doubt. As I pointed out earlier in this lecture, faith is a complex idea that goes far beyond simply asserting or holding that certain things are true. Faith, sure, goes beyond what's logically de demonstrable, but faith is capable of rational motivation and foundation. And again, faith is not a blind leap into the dark. It's about discovering a bigger picture of things of which we are part. So, can we be certain about our faith? Well, as we've seen, most people long for absolute certainty because we want to see the big picture, to know things with precision, and to be absolutely sure about everything. But the harsh reality is that life just isn't like that. I mentioned Isaiah Berlin earlier. Let's, let's come back to him. Berlin once pointed out there are three kinds of human knowledge. First, there's what reason can prove with certainty. Now, this turns out actually rather little. It's absolutely certain that two and two make four, but it doesn't exactly give you a reason to live or indeed even to get up in the morning. Secondly, there's what science can prove to be true with certainty. And again, that proves to be rather less than many would expect. Sure, water is H2O, but bear in mind that scientific advance often means that theories that were once regarded as completely reliable are now abandoned and replaced with other ones. I mean, to give you a very good example, which is really important apologetically, a hundred years ago, scientists thought the universe had always existed, and so they, they poked fun at the Christian idea of creation. But nowadays, of course, the scientific consensus is the universe came into being through the cosmic explosion we call the Big Bang, and the idea of creation has made something of a comeback. But what about Isaiah Berlin's third category of knowledge? And in this category, Berlin gathers together beliefs that cannot be proved, but are nonetheless vital to human life. And these beliefs are answers to questions like these. What 
is the meaning of life. Is democracy better than fascism? Why am I here? Is there a God? Is oppression evil? Should we work for the elimination of poverty? Now, Berlin's point is that no absolutely certain answers can be given to these questions. We can't be sure. But you and I both know that doesn't stop anyone from committing themselves to these beliefs or actions based on them. Most people realize that the really important things in life can not be proved, so they make judgments. They make judgments about what's right, and then they get on with life based on those beliefs. That's just a pragmatic way people deal with it, and that's what we need to tell people about. We may not be able to prove these things, but we nevertheless trust them and live on their basis. So what sort of things are we talking about here? Well, let me give you one example. This will be helpful. And of course, please supplement these, this with your own examples if you're getting involved in discussions of people. Back in 1948, the United Nations reaffirmed its faith in fundamental human rights. Now, my point is that the statements of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights can be proved logically or scientifically. Nor, of course, can the belief that oppression is evil. You just can't prove these things, but nevertheless, they really matter to people. People make them their life's work, believing they're right and important. Now, here's a point that's made by the British literary critic Terry Eagleton. Eagleton's a really interesting writer, and I encourage you to make his acquaintance. And in a very powerful critique of Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, he made this point, which I think is a very telling criticism of the kind of rationalism that I've been critiquing in this lecture. Listen to this. We hold many beliefs that have no unimpeachably rational justification but are nonetheless reasonable to entertain. In other words, you can't prove these, but it's still perfectly reasonable to believe them. And belief in God is one of these. And I suppose we could say, so are others like Marxism or the atheism of writers like Richard Dawkins. These are beliefs. They cannot prove they are right. The new atheism, again, I must stress this point, cannot prove its core beliefs and thus often finds itself severely embarrassed when challenged to prove its belief in the non-existence of God. And here's the important point. It's not just Christians who doubt. Many atheists doubt as well, as they realize the intellectual vulnerability of their position. Now, to believe in God demands an act of faith, but so does the decision not to believe in God. Neither are based on absolute certainty, nor can they be. So my point is that to accept Christ demands a leap of faith, but so does the decision to reject him. The decision, whatever it may be, rests upon faith. There's an element of doubt in each case. Every attitude to Christ, except the decision not to have any attitude at all, rests on faith, not certainty. So here's my point. We need to see doubt in perspective. If something really matters, it lies beyond proof. In fact, let me suggest that the more important an idea is, the harder it is to prove with certainty. Now, the British 19th century poet Tennyson made this point rather nicely in his poem, The Ancient Sage. Listen to this and see how you could use these lines of poetry in your own apologetic ministry. For nothing worthy proving can be proven, nor yet disproven. See the point? Nobody can prove what the meaning of life is, but that doesn't stop us thinking about it or finding answers that we find deeply compelling and meaningful. So you see, the atheism Christian thus face the same problem. C.S. Lewis, who abandoned his atheism of Christianity after a crisis of faith in the intellectual reliability of a godless worldview, summarized the atheist dilemma, I think, rather well. A young atheist, he wrote, cannot guard his faith too carefully. Dangers lie in wait for him on every side. That, I have to say, was my own experience when I ceased being an atheist, as I realized it didn't make sense and there were better options. 
But listen, doubt can be helpful. I think it's very important to say this. Doubt helps us to realize we have not fully grasped the richness and depth of our faith. And you know, many people skim the surface of their faith without really thinking about very much. They believe, for example, in the Trinity without uh, having really thought about very much. But what are the reasons for this belief and what difference does it make? And part of my own journey of faith was my realisation that I needed to develop a discipleship of the mind in which I explored the reason for faith myself and, of course, helped other people to do the same. So here's my point. We need more Christians who think about their faith, especially in the light of the challenges we face from the new atheists. And remember, apologetics needs to be done for Christian audiences as well as those beyond the church. Now, not surprisingly, uh, atheists get a little annoyed when Christians challenge their beliefs and point out they lack a good evidential basis. That's a very important point. But you know we need a new generation of Christians who think about their faith, who know what they believe and why they believe it. That's why Lewis was such an effective apologist. He'd been an atheist, he became a Christian, and he knew why he was a Christian. I think we need to say here that doubt can be a stimulus to think about our faith and go deeper into it. So I think one of the points I want to make here is that, you know, people shouldn't get too preoccupied or self-absorbed with doubt. Uh, Instead of getting preoccupied with doubt, get to work on renewing, deepening and consolidating your faith in God. But, you know, it's time to move on. And in the next lecture tomorrow, I want to explore how we might answer some of the questions that people are likely to ask us about Christianity. So I look forward to speaking to you again very soon.